are listening to Ideas on Trapped with Toby Lawson. Hello everyone, and you are listening to Ideas on Trap podcast. This episode is a continuation of my two-part conversation with Lance Pritchett. It concludes the discussion with the five things Lance would recommend to a policymaker on education policy, how to balance the globalized demand for good governance with the design of state functionalities within a localized context, along with our cities in development, charter cities, and many other interesting tidbits. I hope you find this conversation as enjoyable as I did. And once again, many thanks to Lan Pritchard. See you all again next time. Now, on a lighter note, there's this trope when I was in high school. So I, I sort of want us to put both side by side and, yeah. you know, try to learn more about them. There's this trope when I was in high school amongst my mates that examination is not a true test of knowledge, you know. And although it didn't help the people who were saying it because they usually don't test well. So it it sort of sounded like a self-serving argument, you know. But examination now, or should I say the examination industry, clearly, I mean, if I want to take Nigeria as an example, it's not working. But Mm. it seemed to be the gold standard, if I want to use that phrase. It's as bad as so many firms now set up graduate training programs, even after people have completed tertiary education. You know, they still have to train them for industry and even sometimes on basic things. So what are the shortcomings of examination, the way you have distinguished both? And then how can a system that truly assesses learning be designed? So, and let me revert to a Indian discussion, because I know more about India than Africa by far. There are prominent people, including the people around Jaipal and Kartik Muraladharan, who say, look, India never really had an education system. It had a selection system. And the ethos was, look, we're just throwing kids into school with the hopes of identifying the few kids who were bright enough, capable enough, smart enough, however we say it, measured by their performance on this kind of high stakes examination who were going to then become the elite. So it was just a filter into the elite. And it really meant the whole system was never really in its heart of heart geared around a commitment to educating every kid. I've heard teachers literally say out loud, you know, when they give an exam and the kids don't master the material, they'll say, oh, those weren't the kind of kids who this material was meant for. And they leave them behind, right? They teach, (laughs) there's a phrase, they teach to the front of the class, right? You order the class by the kid's academic performance, and then the teachers are just teaching to the front of the class with the kind of like, nah, you, you know, even by early grades. So the evils of the examination system <laughs> are only if it's not combined with an education system. So essentially, an education system would be a system that was actually committed to expanding the learning and capabilities of all kids at all levels and getting everybody up to a threshold and then worried about the filter problem much later in the education process. So if they're part of an education system like they have been in East Asia, they're not terribly, terribly damaging. But if they're part of a selection system in which you know people perceive that the point is that there's only a tiny little fraction that are going to pass through these examinations anyway, and what we're trying to do is maximize the pass rates of that, it distorts the whole system start to finish. My friend Rukmini Banerjee in India started this citizen-based assessment where it was just a super simple assessment. You need assessment in order to have an effective education system because without assessment, I don't know what you know or don't know, right? And if I don't know as a teacher or as a school what my kids actually know and don't know, how is anybody imagining that you're giving them an effective education? So I think the role of early assessment 
and the drive to integrate teaching with real-time assessment, I think is hugely, hugely important. This is why I had the preemptive strike on the question of testing, is mm-hmm. that I want radically more assessment earlier integrated with teaching. And, you know, there's still some educationists that will push back against that. But if we put in a bundle formative classroom assessment integrated with effective pedagogy and high stakes examinations, then everybody's going to hate them both. So we have to really unbundle those two things. And the hallmark of an education system is that it really has targets that every kid can learn and believes every kid can learn and builds a system around the premise and promise that every kid can learn. There's this example out there. Vietnam does it. And Vietnam did it and continues to do it at levels of income and social conditions that are very much like many African countries. So if I were a country, I'd kind of hate Vietnam as this goody goody that, you know, you know how you always hated the kid in school who would really do well. And then the teacher would go, well, how come you're not like that kid? <laughs> the country, <laughs> on education, Vietnam is that country. It's like out there producing OECD levels of learning with very little resources and starting, at least in the 1980s, at very, very low levels of income. So they're proving that it's possible. They're the kid who, like, when everybody goes, oh, that exam was too hard. And they're like, Bob passed it. Like, how hard can it be? (laughs) Anyway, so, so I think radically different bases for assessment versus examinations. And to some extent... The only integrity that got preserved in the system wasn't the integrity of the classroom and teaching. It was the integrity of the examination as a filter. I want to ask you now a bit about the political economy of this a little yeah. bit. So if, say, you were talking to a policymaker who mm. is actually serious about education, uh, not in the superficial sense, but really about learning, right, and says, okay, Plant. How do I go about this? How do I design an educational system that really does these things? Right. You know, I've written quite a number of reports here and there that rely so much on your accountability triangle. Um, <laughs> I would have sent you royalty checks, but it wasn't paid work. So sorry. Uh, <laughs> so how exactly would you explain the political economy of designing a working educational system. You know, I know people talk a lot about centralization versus decentralization, who gets empowered, you know, in that accountability triangle. Where should the levers to really push, you know, we are they? So how exactly would you have that conversation? So let me start with the accountability triangle and design issues. You know, I think people mistake what the accountability triangle and design issues are about Mm. in the following sense. Um, If I'm going to design a toaster and the toaster is going to turn my (laughs) untoasted bread into toasted bread and it's going to be an electric toaster, there's certain fundamental things that have to happen, right? I have to have a current. I need to get that current running through something that heats up. I need that heat to be applied to the bread. I need it to stop when I've applied enough heat. Now, those fundamental principles of toaster design can lead to thousands of different actual designs of toasters. So I want people to get out of the notion that there's a single best toaster and that the accountability triangle or any other mode of analysis is to give you the best toaster and then everybody copies the best toaster. The principles are design your own damn toaster, right? There's a gazillion ways to toast bread. Now, all of them to work have to be compatible with the fundamental principle of electricity and current flow. You know, so I'm trying to get to one size doesn't fit all, but any old size doesn't necessarily fit everything either. You know, you raise the question of decentralization, right? The thing is, if you look across countries that have roughly similar learning outcomes from PISA and other assessments, they're radically different designs. France is an entirely centralized system. 
Germany is a completely federalized system. The US is an almost completely localized system. The low countries, Netherlands and Belgium, have money follows the student system into the private sector. They have the highest private sector enrollment of any country in the world because they allow different pillars of education between the secular, the Catholic, and the Protestant to coexist. So then if you ask, is decentralization the best way to design your education system? It's like, no, 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 no. You're missing the point. The mm. point is, if you choose a centralized system, there are principles in how you design the flows of accountability <clears throat> that are going to produce success and those that are going to produce failure. If you choose a decentralized system, there are systems of the alignment of accountability that are going to produce success and failure. So the analytical framework doesn't determine the grand design, it determines the mechanics of the design. And I, I just want to get that straight up front. Second, yeah. um, as a result of the eight year research project of RISE, we have a policy brochure that has kind of here are the five kind of principles and here's the 15 minutes. If I have five minutes with a minister or mm -hmm. leader of a country, here are the five things I want them to tell. And the first of those things, is commit. A lot of times we want to skip the most fundamental stage. And what I mean by commit is you actually need to create a broad social and political consensus that you're really going to do this and that you're committed to it. Um, you know, this big research project RISE, which was based out of Oxford and I've been head of for eight years, we included Vietnam as one of our focus countries because it was a success case. Hence, we wanted our research team to partly do research about Vietnam and issues that were relevant in Vietnam. But we really wanted to answer the question, how did Vietnam do this? Why did they succeed? Right. And five years into the research effort, I was with the Vietnamese team and they had produced a bunch of empirical research of the econometric type. Is Vietnam's success associated with this or that measurable input? Nothing really explains Vietnam at the approximate determinant input level. And finally, one of the researchers said to me, Lant, we're trying to get around the fundamental fact that Vietnam succeeded because they wanted to. Mm. And on one level, it's like my first response was, I can't go back and tell the British taxpayers that they paid a million dollars for a research project on Vietnam. <laughs> and the conclusion to why Vietnam succeeded was because they wanted to. That's on another level, one knows, right? Yeah. On another level, it's a deep and ignored truth. The policymakers ignore it. The donors ignore it. Everybody wants to ignore it. Everybody wants to assume it's a technocratic issue. It's a design issue. I think... The fundamental problem of these failing and dysfunctional education systems, it's a purpose problem. The purpose of education isn't clear, understood, widely accepted among all of the people from top to bottom responsible for achieving results. And once that leads to what I call norm erosion within the teachers, there's this norm erosion of what does it really mean to be a teacher? So again, the first and maybe only thing I would say if I had five minutes with a leader is how are you going to produce a broad social, political and organizational commitment that you are really going to achieve specific agreed upon learning results? The technical design issues have to flow from that commitment rather than vice versa. And you could copy France's system, you could copy the Vietnamese system. You know, I think you've heard the term from me and others, isomorphic mimicry. Yeah. You can copy other people's systems and not have the same effect if it isn't driven by purpose. Like if you don't have the fundamental commitment and you don't have the fundamental agreed upon purpose, the rest of the technical design is irrelevant. It sort of leads me to my next theme. And that is the capability question in development. Yeah. First of all, I also want to make a quick distinction because lately, uh, well, when I say lately, that's a little vague. State capacity is all the rage now in development, you know. <laughs> really? Is that true? Yeah. yeah. I'm so happy to hear that. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, mean I, I, I mean, I'm glad that you think so, and I hope that that's true. Because it wasn't, right? It really wasn't yeah. on the agenda in a serious way. So anyway. 
Yeah, yeah. But I also think there's also a bit of a, a misunderstanding still. And usually, uh, again, maybe I'm just moving with the wrong crowd. I mean, who knows? People focus a lot more on the coercive instruments of the state and how much of it can be wielded to achieve certain programmatic results for state capacity. Um, Revenue to GDP in Nigeria is low. How can the state collect more taxes? You know, mm. how much can the state squeeze out of people's bank accounts, out of <laughs> companies? <laughs> right. You know, or the reverse that oh, the reason why the state collects very little taxes is because state capacity is low. But I mean, nobody really unpacks what they mean by that. You know, they just rely on these measures. You know, mm. like x to gdp ratio another recent example was i think it was in 2020 when the pandemic sort of yeah blew over and china built a hospital with 10,000 uh, <laughs> that capacity in i don't know i forgot maybe 20 days or yeah you know, and, was amazing. You know a lot of people was like oh yeah that's an example of state capacity of it's very much the same people now are turning around and seeing China as an example of failure on how to respond to a pandemic. So I guess where I would ask you is when you talk about the capability of the state, what exactly do we mean? (laughs) So in the work that we're done and the book that we wrote, we adopt a very specific definition of capability which is an organizational measure because there there are all these aggregate country level measures and we use them in the book but in the end i think it's easier to define capability at the organizational level and at the organizational level (laughs) i define the capability of an organization is the ability to consistently induce its agents to take the policy actions in response to circumstances that advance the normative objective of the organization. And that's a long, complicated definition, but it basically means can the organization from the frontline worker to the top of the organization, can it get people to do what they need to do to accomplish the purpose? And that's what I mean by the capability of an organization. And, you know, fortunately, unfortunately, like militaries, I think, make for a good example. It's amazing that high functioning militaries have soldiers who will sacrifice their lives and die if needs be to advance the purpose of the organization. Whereas you can have a million man army that's a paper tiger. No one Mm is actually willing to do what it takes to carry out the purpose that the organization has been put to of fighting a particular conflict. And I think starting from that level makes it clear that A, this is about purpose. B, it's about inducing the agents to take the actions that will lead to outcomes. And the reason why I'm super happy (laughs) to hear (laughs) that capability is being talked about is, you know, this, these, you're doing a very good job as an interviewer drawing out connections between these various topics. It's, you know, the design of the curriculum is almost completely irrelevant to what's happening in schools. And so there's been way, way too much focus in my mind in development discourse on technocratic design and way too little on what's actually going to happen in practice. And so my definition of capability is you measure an organization's capability by what actually happens in practice. What are the teachers actually going to do day to day, right? And, you know, having been in development a long time, I often sit in these rooms where people are just, you know, I go out to the field and teachers aren't there at the school. Teachers are sitting in the office drinking their tea while the kids are running around on the playground, even during scheduled instructional time. And then I go back (laughs) and hear discussions in the Capitol about higher order 21st century skills. And it's like, look, there's no, 
you know, I wrote this article about India called Is India a Flailing State? Yeah. And what I yeah. meant by flailing is there was no connection between what was happening in the cerebrum and what was being designed at the center and what was actually happening when the actual fingers were touching the material and the nerves and sinews and muscles that connected the design to the practice were completely deteriorated and therefore capability was the issue, not design. So that's what I mean by capability. I, I mean, you know, you use the example of tax. I think it's a great example. It's like, can you design a tax authority that actually collects taxes? And, and, and it's a hard, difficult question. And I think by starting from capability, I mean, I was really struck by your description of capability being linked to the coercive power of the state, because that's exactly not how I would start it. I would start it with what are the key purposes for which the state is being deployed and for which one can really generate a sufficient integrated consensus that we need capability for this purpose? Now, one of my favorite blogs of yours was how you described, I think it was how the U.S. escaped the tyranny of experts, something like that, hmm. you know. So I want to talk about that a bit versus what I would call the cult of best practice, you know, mm. like these institutions that are usually transplanted all over the world and things like independent central bank and, you know, this and that, you know, and you described how a lot of the centralized institutions that exist in the United States, they were keenly contested, you know, before... Yes the consensus sort of formed around. So I'm sort of wondering, you know, developing countries, how are they going about this wrong vis-a-vis -vis the technical advice they are getting from development agencies? And the issue with that, if I would say, is, you know, we now live in a world where the demand for good governance is globalized. Millions of Nigerians live on the internet every day and they see how life is mm. in the industrial rich world and they want the same things. They want the same rights. They want governments that treat them the same way. Someone like me would even argue for an independent central bank because we've also experienced what life is otherwise. Right. <laughs> so. How exactly to navigate this difficult terrain? Because the other way isn't also working. Because you can't say you have an independent central bank on paper. That is not really independent. And it's not working. I mean, your questions are such a brilliant articulation of the challenges that are being faced. And the complex world we live in, because we live now in an integrated world where people can see what's happening in other places. And that integrated world creates in and of itself positive pressures for performance, but also creates a lot of pressures for isomorphism, for deflecting the actual realities and what it will take to fix and make improvements with deflective copies of stuff that has no organic roots. You know, I've written lots of things and, you know, even though you, you love all of your children, <laughs> you might have favorites. Um, one of my favorite blogs is a blog I wrote that is, I think, the most under-cited um, blog of mine relative to what I think of it, which is about the M16 versus the AK-47. Oh, yeah. I and I that. think it's an awkward analogy because no one wants to talk about guns. Mm. <laughs> but I think it's a really great analogy because the M16, in terms of its proving ground performance, is an unambiguously superior, more accurate rifle. The developing world adopts the AK-47, and that's because the Russian approach to weapon design was design the weapon to the soldier, and the American approach is train the soldier to the weapon. And what happens again and again across all kinds of phenomena in development is the people who are coming as part of the donor and development community to give advice to the world all want them to adopt the M16 because it's the best gun. And, 
they don't have the soldiers that can maintain the M16. And the M16 has gotten better, but when it was first introduced, it was a notoriously unreliable weapon. And the one thing as a soldier you don't want to happen is you pull the trigger and the bullet doesn't come out the end. You know, that's what happens when you don't maintain an M16. So I think this isomorphism pressure confuses what best practice is with assuming there's this global best practice that can be adopted independently of the underlying capacity of the individuals and capability of the organizations. So I think huge problem. Second, I think there is a super important element of the history that the modes of doing things that now exist in the Western world and which we think of as being modern, I'm using scare quotes, which doesn't help in a podcast, but we think (laughs) of as being modern and best practice, had to struggle their way into existence without the benefit of isomorphism, right? In the sense that when the United States in the early 20th century underwent a huge and quite conflicted and contested process of the consolidation of one room kind of locally operated schools into more professionalized school systems. That was politically contested and socially contested. And the only way the newer schools could justify themselves was by actually being better. There was no, oh, but this is how it has to be done because this is how it has been done in these other places and they have succeeded. And so there was no recourse to isomorphism, right? So in some sense, I think the world would be a radically better place for doing development if we just stopped allowing best practice to have any traction at all. If Nigerians just said, screw it, we don't want to hear about it. Like we want to do in Nigeria what's going to work better in Nigeria and telling me what Norway does and does not do, just no. Just no, we don't want to hear about it. Like that doesn't help because it creates this vector of pressures that really deteriorate the necessary local contestation. My colleague, Michael Wilcock, who is a sociologist, has characterized the development process as a series of good struggles. And in our you know, work on state capability, we say you can't juggle without the struggle. Like you can't transplant the ability to juggle. I can give you juggling lessons. I can show you juggling videos. But if you don't pick up the balls and do it, and if you don't pick up the balls and do it with the understanding that unless you juggle, you haven't juggled, you can never learn to juggle. So I think if development were radically more about enabling good local struggles in which new policies, procedures, practices had to struggle their way into existence, justifying themselves on performance against purpose, we would be light years ahead of where we are. And that's what the debate about capability has to be. And I think (laughs) to the extent the capability discourse gets deflected into another set of standards and more isomorphism just this time about capability, I think we're going to lose something. Whereas if we start the state capability for discussion of what is it that we really want and need our government to get better at doing in terms of solving concrete locally nominated problems, and then how are we going to come about creating the capability for do that in the Nigerian context? I mean, just using Nigeria could use Nepal, yeah, could use yeah. any other country. That's the discussion that needs to happen. And the more the kind of global discourse and the global best practice gets frozen out completely. The sooner that happens, the better off we'll be. So I guess where I was going with that is one of those uh, also fantastic descriptions you guys used in in the book is crawling the design space, you know, Mm. on capability. So now for me as a Nigerian, I might say, I do not necessarily want Nigeria to look like the United States, you know, and because, I mean, it wouldn't work anyways. But at the same time, you don't want to experiment and end up like Venezuela or Zimbabwe. (laughs) No, that's, that's, 
Um, so, I mean, it may not work to design your central no. bank like the U.S. Federal Reserve, but at the same time, you don't want 80% inflation like Turkey. So, where is the I, midway, I, I, so to speak? I, I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I get this pushback when I, you know, rail on best practice. I often get the pushback, well, why would we reinvent the wheel? And I've developed a PowerPoint slide that responds to that by showing the tiniest little gear that goes into a Swiss watch and a huge 20 foot large tire that goes on a piece of construction machinery. And they say they're both wheels. Mm. Like nobody's talking about reinventing the wheel. There are fundamental principles of electricity that a toaster design has to be compatible with. So again, there is a trade-off. There are fundamental principles but there's a gazillion instantiations of those principles, right? We don't want to start assuming that there's a single wheel, <laughs> right? When people say don't reinvent the wheel, it's like nobody's reinventing the idea of a wheel. But every wheel that works is an adaptation of the idea of a wheel to the instantiation and purpose for which it's being put. And if you said to me, oh, because we're not going to reinvent the wheel, we're going to take this tiny gear from a Swiss wash and put it on a construction machine and expect it to roll. It's like, no, that's just goofy, right? And what I've really tried to do in the course of my career is equip people with tools to think through their own circumstances. Coming mm. back to the accountability triangle or the crawling the design space. What I'm not trying to do is tell somebody, here is what you should do in your circumstance. Because my experience is, What's actually doable and is going to lead to long run progress is an unbelievably complicated and granular thing that involves the realities of the context. But what I do want to do is help people understand there are certain common principles here and some things are going to lead to like Venezuela like circumstances and we've seen it happen again and again. But there are a variety of pathways that don't lead to that and you need to choose a pathway that works for you. And, you know, the PDAA isn't a set of recommendations. It's a set of tools to help people think through their own circumstances, their own organization, their own nominated problems and make progress on them. The accountability triangle isn't a recommendation for the design of your system. It's a set of tools that equip people to have conversations about their own system. And I have to say, I, I, I one time was in someplace in Indonesia, and it was a discussion of PDAA being mediated by some organization that had adopted it and was teaching people how to do it in Indonesia. And I had the wonderful experience of having this Indonesian woman who was a district official working on health describe in some detail how they were using PDAA to address the problem of maternal mortality with no idea who I was. Mm. <laughs> And I was like, oh, just for me to hear her say, here is how I use the tool to address a problem I've never thought about in a context I'd never, you know, in an organization I've never worked with. So I think equipping people with tools to enable them in their own local struggles is my real objective, <laughs> rather than the imagination that I somehow can come up with recommendations that are going to work in a specific context. So the don't reinvent the wheel is just complete total nonsense. It's, it's like <laughs> every wheel is adapted to its purpose and we're just giving you tools to adapt the idea of the wheel to your purpose. You know, adapting a square to the purpose just isn't going to work. So I agree, you know, we want to start from the idea of things that work. And there are principles of wheel design that you can't violate. You know, you can't come in and say, I'm going to have a participatory design of a water system that depends on water running uphill. No, water runs downhill. <laughs> That's a fundamental principle of water. So, you know, but I, I think the principles are much broader and the potentiality for locally designed and organically produced instantiations of common principles are much broader than the current discourse gives the possibility for. I can't let you go without getting your thoughts on a few, just a few more questions, you know, so indulge me. Uh, I've stayed largely away from our cities because there's a bunch of podcasts where your thoughts can be 
fairly assessed on that issue. But I mean, it's not going away, right? So for me, there's the ethical question, there's the methodological question, and there's the sort of philosophical question to it. I'm not qualified to have the methodological question, not at all, no. Maybe on the ethics, well, I don't know, there's a lot of uh, also biases that gets, so I'm not, I'm not gonna go there. So for me, wh when I think about our cities, and I'm fairly close here in Nigeria with the effective altruism community, my wife is very active, uh, <laughs> and I have this debate with them a lot. Uh, and I mean, surprisingly, a lot of them are also debating plant preachers, which is which is good, right? Now, the way I see it is, the whole thing seems too easy in the sense that no disrespect to anybody working in this space at all, in the sense that it seems optimizing for what can be measured versus what works. So for me, the way I look at it is, it's very difficult to know the welfare effects for maybe a cohort of households. If you put a power station in my community, which has not had power for a while. So, but it's pretty easy if you have a fund and you distribute cash to households and you sort of divide them into a control group and, you know, so which then makes it totally strange if you conclude from that 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 is the best way to sort of intervene in the <laughs> welfare and the well-being of even that community or a people generally. So, I mean, where am I going wrong here? Yeah, how am I not getting it? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, the people listening to the podcast can't see me on the camera trying to reach out and give you a big hug. Um, I think you have it exactly right. I think we should go back and re-record this podcast where I ask you questions and your questions are the answer. So I, I think you've got the answer exactly right. So first of all, by the way, the original rhetoric and practice of RCTs is going away and roughly has gone away. Because the original okay. rhetoric was independent impact evaluation. All of the rhetoric out of JPAL and IPA and the other practitioners is now partnerships, which is not independent. But essentially, everybody's adopted the crawl, the design space use of evidence for feedback loops and making organizations better. So they've all created their own words for it because they don't want to admit that they're just, again, borrowing <laughs> other ideas. So, so to a large extent, the whole community is moving in a very positive direction towards integrating, seeking out relevant evidence for partner organizations in how can they crawl the design space and be effective. And they're just not admitting it because it's embarrassing how wrong they were first, but they've come to the right space. So I want to give them credit. You know, when I gave a presentation at NYU, called the debate about RCTs is over and I won. It's not a very helpful approach. It's true, but it's not very helpful because I have to let them do what they're now doing, which is exactly what I said they should have been doing and they are now doing. So to some extent, you know, asking people to say, yeah, 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 we changed what we're doing is a big ask. And I'd rather they actually change what they're doing than they admit they did that. So to some extent, it is going away. I think it's going away as it was originally designed as this independent white coat guys descend on some people and force them to carry out an impact evaluation to justify their existence. That just never, you know, they're, they're much more integrated. Let's crawl the design space in partnership with organizations. Let's use randomization in more A-B testing ways. And so I feel it's moving in a very positive direction with this weird rhetoric on top of it. Second, I think you're exactly right. And I think it's slightly worse than you said, because it's not just about what can be measured, but it's about attributability. It's not just what can be measured, but what can be attributed directly causally to individual actions. And my big debate with the effective altruism community is I'm hugely, you know, 
big, big, big wins from the effective altruism movement, attacking kind of virtue signaling, useless kind of philanthropic endeavors. I think every person should be happy for them. And I think I hard to, but if I were African, I would be sick of this philanthropic bullshit that you guys are going to come and like give us a cow or, you know, Bill or Gates talking see. about it. chickens. <laughs> it's like, it's like my wife, my wife doesn't do development at all. She's a music teacher. But when she heard Bill Gates talking about chickens, she think, does Bill Gates think chickens haven't been in Africa for hundreds of years? Like, what does he think he knows about chickens that Africans don't know about chickens? That's just such chicken shit, right? But again, I'll promote a blog. I have a blog called Let's All Play for Team Development. And I think what you're raising in your thing is, is that it's not just what we can measure. It's what we can measure and attribute to the actions of a specific actor. Because... You know, your example of not having power in a village, that we can measure. But all of the system things that we've talked about so far, migration, education, state capability, these aren't going to be solved by individualized interventions. They're going to be solved by systemic things. And, you know, with my team on education, we've had this big research project on education standards. But I keep telling my team, look, if you're not part of a wave, you're a drop in the ocean. The only way for your efforts to not be a drop in the ocean is for you to be part of a wave. Other people around you working on the same issue, pushing in the same direction to build that. And that kind of thing gets undermined by attributability. So, you know, with my Rise Project, I sometimes tell my funders, you can have success or you can have attributability, but you can't have both. Right. Because if we're going to be successful at changing the global discourse on education, we're not going to do it by ourselves. We're going to be part of a team and a network. So anyways, by the way, like early, early, early in the effective altruism movement, I had an interview with uh, Kerry Tuna and I think Holden Karnofsky when they were you know, thinking about what to do. And I made exactly this point. It's like, look, being effective at the individualized interventions that are happening is one thing. But don't ignore these huge systemic issues because you can't measure the direct cause and effect between the philanthropic donation and the outcome. Mm. And that's your point, I think, which is, you know, Nigeria is not going to get fixed by cash transfers. <laughs> I mean, for heaven's sakes, if Nigeria had the cash to transfer to everybody and fix it, well, then the national development struggle wouldn't be what it is. It's a I mean, systemic I'm struggle across a number of fronts to donate the money <laughs> yeah no but but again even bill gates his fortune relative to the you know the impact you could have through these programs relative to what happens uh with national development is just night and day uh mm. so to the extent that the adoption of a specific methodology precludes serious evidence-based hard struggle work on the big systemic issues it's a net negative Again, to use your term, kinky ideas in development. Yeah. I was reading a profile, the FT, a couple of days ago, all about charter cities, right? Which is about, about what? Charter cities. Oh yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. So hmm. it was an idea I was kind of into for a while. I mean, from Paul Roma's original presentation at TED. But you strongly argued against it at your Cato debate. So, like, what is wrong with that idea? Because, I mean, there are advocates, there are investors who think charter cities are this new thing that is going to provide the space for the kind of organizational and policy experimentation. And China's SEZs are usually the go to examples, Shenzhen particularly, you know. Yeah, so yeah. what do you have to say about that? I like discussing charter cities. Okay. And the reason I like discussing charter cities is they're not <clears throat> kinky, right? My complaint about kinky is that you've drawn this line in human welfare and you act as if development is only getting people over these Larry Lobar thresholds. Hmm. So Conditional cash transfers are an example of kinky, and conditional cash transfers are just stupid, right? <laughs> Charter cities <laughs> are wrong. I mean, conditional cash transfers are just stupid in a trivial way. Charter cities are wrong in a very deep and sophisticated way. So I love talking about charter cities. So the reason I love talking about charter cities is, A, they have the fundamental problem posed right. 
the fundamental problem is countries and systems are trapped in a low level equilibrium and that low level equilibrium is actually a stable equilibrium and so you need to shock your way out of it mm. and there the contest between me and charter cities is i think there's good struggle paths out of low level equilibrium mm. so i'm a strategic incrementalist i want to have a strategic vision but i want incremental action So I'm against the kinky, which is often incremental incremental. It doesn't really add up to a development agenda. So I like, yes, <laughs> we need to have a way out of this low level equilibrium and state capability and the way education systems work and the way economic policies keep countries from achieving high productivity, et cetera. But I'm a good struggle guy. Mm -hmm. uh, and charter cities want magic bullet, right? Now, the rationale for magic bullet is that good struggle is hard and hasn't necessarily proved <laughs> successful and these institutional features that lead to these low level traps just are resistant to good struggle methods out and i'm i think that's a really important debate to be having but i think the right way to interpret china's experience and yen yen ang's book on how china did it is i think a good illustration of this is china was good struggle using regional variations as a way of enabling good struggles it's instructive that difficulty with charter cities always goes back you keep going deeper and deeper of who's going to enforce this who's going to enforce this who's going to enforce this you know they're caught in their own catch 22 in my mind so you yeah. know the first so proposed what appeared to be feasible charter city in Honduras eventually got undermined by governance issues in which the major investor didn't want to actually be subject to rules based decision making anyway so i love talking about charter cities i think they're on the right set of issues of how do we get to the institutional conditions that can create a positive environment for high productivity firms and engagement and improve governance and they have a coherent argument which is good <laughs> that <laughs> you know it's a low level trap and there's there's no path out of the low level trap and so we need big shock to get out of it but i don't think they're ultimately correct about the way in which you can establish the fundamentals you can't just big jump your way to having reliable enforcement mechanisms and until you get to reliable enforcement mechanisms the whole charter city idea is still kind of up in the air mm -hmm. the next podcast i have scheduled to do is with the charter cities podcast so that oh hopefully interesting <laughs> last question yeah we sort of have a tradition on the show where i ask the guests to discuss one new idea they would like to see spread everywhere but i think more in line with your own brand <laughs> like you said earlier i think i would like to ask for our own exclusive ideas on trap exclusive lantern you know something you haven't mm -hmm. talked about before or really so you can go on for however long you wish <laughs> and that's the last question <laughs> i i think if i had to pick something that if we could just get rid of it it would be this fantasy that technology is going to solve problems mm. my basic point i make again and again and again is moore's law which is the doubling of computer capacity every two years has been chugging along and it might have slowed down but has been chugging along since 1965. so computing power is improved by a factor of 10 to the 11th and just as an illustration of just how big 10 to the 11th is the speed you drive on a freeway of 60 miles an hour is only 10 to the 7th smaller than the speed of light mm -hmm. so 10 to the 11th is a astronomically huge number in the sense that only astronomers have any use for numbers as big as 10 to the 11th okay my claim is anything that hasn't been fixed by a 10 to the 11th change in computing power isn't going to get fixed by computing power and you know I ask people sometimes in audiences okay particularly with older people you look a little young for this question but I ask them okay you older people that have been married for a long time computing power has gone up 10 to the 11th over the course of your marriage has it made your marriage any better and they're like oh well, a little bit sometimes when we're abroad we can communicate over Skype easier but on the other hand 
you know, it's made it worse because there's more distractions and more temptations to not pay attention to your spouse. So a net 10 to the 11th of computing power hasn't improved average marriage quality. And then I ask him, has it improved your access to pornography? And it's like, mm. of course, night and day, like more instantaneous access to pornography. And my concluding thing is a huge amount of what is being promoted in the name of tech is the pornography of X rather than the real deal. So people promoting tech and education are promoting the pornography of education rather than real education. People that are promoting tech and government are promoting the pornography of governance rather than true governance. And it's just like, no, these are deeper human issues. And there's all kinds of human issues that they're fundamentally technologically resilient and expecting technology to solve human problems is just a myth. It enables salespeople to pound down people's door to sell government officials some new software that's going to do this or that. But without the purpose, without the commitment, without the fundamental human norms of behavior, technology isn't going to solve anything. And the pretense that it is, is distracting a lot of people from getting to the serious work. So if we could just replace the technology of X with the pornography of X, I think we'd be better off in discussions of what its real potentialities are. How's Thank that you. for a original? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. asked for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a lot to think about. Yeah. Thank you so much for doing this. Thanks for a great yeah. interview, Toby. That was yeah. super fun. We could go back and record this with my asking questions and your questions being the answers because you're really sophisticated on all these issues. You're in exactly the right space. So thank you very Great. much. Great. Okay. If you haven't done so already, you can subscribe to the show on any of your favorite podcast vendors. That may be Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or any of the rest. Don't forget to rate us on your platform. It helps others find the show. Or you can just listen or download on our website, www.ideasontrapped.com.